In our last study, we began studying uh, the Christ coming in the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're going to continue that study in this message. The Feast of Passover and Pentecost have already been fulfilled in Jesus. But there's no record at all of the Feast of Tabernacles ever finding fulfillment in the early church or the New Testament. God fulfilled the first two feasts, and he's going to fulfill the third. And the third feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, remains to be fulfilled. What sets the Feast of Tabernacles apart from all others is the abundance enjoyed during the feast. It's the full harvest. At the celebration of Tabernacles, not only had the barley and wheat been harvested, but also all other grains, the fruit of trees, the olives, the grapes, all that could possibly serve as food or drink. The harvest was complete at the time of Tabernacles. On the spiritual plane, this points to the fact that God has been using his people everywhere to whatever degree he has prepared the vessel for that revelation of the Christ. There has been an unfolding of his purpose, the outflow of his life, and the manifestation of himself throughout this church age, right up to the present time. But there is yet to come the ultimate, the total, and complete revelation of Jesus. Not limited things, not to get a number of people saved and filled with the Spirit and healed and blessed and used, but the kingdom of God coming with power and with glory as an expression and a manifestation of God in his total capacity with no limitations, with all the power, with all the glory, all the might, all the majesty, all the authority, so that nations will be swept into the kingdom of God, creation delivered, and the last enemy, death, destroyed from off the face of the earth forevermore. As Isaiah 45 says, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. What I am proclaiming and declaring is that there is a third experience in God. There is a visitation, an appearing, and coming of the Lord called tabernacles that is going to come to pass in the church today, right here on the earth, and the implications of this feast go far beyond anything you or I could possibly imagine. Today, more than 20 centuries since Jesus came, the Jews the world over continue to worship in their synagogues according to the Mosaic customs, in apparent ignorance of the fact that the mighty God has forever abolished that order and replaced it with the higher order of his spirit in the true church, which is his body. Likewise, there is a vast multitude of Christians today who will not believe what the Lord is saying to the church at this time. God's purpose is to change the order and establish a new spiritual administration over the earth. After every experience in God, God pleads with us to move on. He will woo and entice and urge us onward for a season. But if the call is not heeded, He will move on and those who will not heed His calling will march around and around their little mountains until they die in the terrible and dread wilderness. The church world today has no vision of what is about to happen. All it can think about is getting raptured away into the clouds. Our prime concern is to prepare the ground for the truth concerning the Feast of Tabernacles, which surpasses the glory of Pentecost even as the noonday surpasses the brightness of early dawn. If the saints of God could only catch a glimmer of the glory of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is even now looming before us, they could not possibly cling to the stagnant remains of yesterday's visitations. Passover was wonderful, but how much more wonderful has Pentecost been in its fullness? And if Pentecost is wonderful, how much more shall we expect tabernacles to exceed it in glory? I cannot overemphasize the infinite importance of the appearing of Christ. There is a people today who love his appearing. Vast multitude of Christians will be thrilled with the passing temporal blessings of his next visitation, but the elect will behold the glory of Christ and will be made one with him in every aspect of himself that he discloses. The nominal Christian will find great joy in the fact that a new anointing is present and that glorious things are being accomplished throughout the earth, but the elect will see Christ and will be made glad partakers of his glory. Christ will be the theme of this next move of God on the earth. We do not desire more messages about him. We are simply crying out to know him in all his glorious and eternal reality. 
The day is coming when our capacity shall be so enlarged that we can receive the full unveiling of our Lord and the glories that are His. And He will give us such revelations of the Father that we will indeed enter into His glory and joy. Then we shall see Him face to face and shall behold all things clearly with nothing between to obscure the vision. This mortal shall have put on immortality and this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. The Father's name will be written in our forehead. Revelation 3, 1 says, Behold, I come quickly. And Revelation 22, 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22, 20 says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The word quickly in these passages is from the Greek word taku, T-A-C-H-U meaning shortly, without delay, swiftly, speedily, or suddenly. I want to draw your attention to the speediness or suddenness of the Lord's coming. This principle of suddenness adheres to almost all the appearings and comings of the Lord. Let's take a look at a few examples. Malachi 3, 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Mark chapter 13, verses 35 through 36 says, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 14 say, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Then there was Saul of Tarsus, who ran headlong into a blinding suddenly. Acts chapter 22, verse 6 through 7 says, And it came to pass that as, I, that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? As Galatians 4, 4 says, the angel's sudden appearance at the birth of the Christ child was in the fullness of time. In Acts chapter 2 verse 1 says that Pentecost took place because its time had fully come. And suddenly the spirit of the ascended and glorified Christ Jesus swept gloriously into the lives of those waiting for the promise. And we too are admonished by the Lord to watch diligently for his coming. Lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. The coming of Christ in the Feast of Tabernacles will break just as unexpectedly and suddenly upon a sleeping church and an unbelieving world as did the coming of the Lord as the Passover Lamb and His coming in mighty spirit power on the day of Pentecost. And I personally believe that the Lord Jesus will come forth in fullness in His elect body on the exact date of the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall of the year. He came in Passover on the exact date that the Jews were celebrating Passover. And he came at Pentecost on the exact date that the Jews were celebrating Pentecost. Therefore, it seems evident to me that the Feast of Tabernacles will occur on the exact date of the feast. The Feast of the Lord portray distinctly the three primary manifestations of the Christ. And it is important that we thoroughly understand that the comings of the Lord have always transpired on the precise dates of the feast which foreshadowed his appearing. The son Jesus was literally physically born, not in December, but at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles in October. The Lamb of God, Christ our Passover, was literally and physically slain for us at the exact hour when the gleaming knives were put to the throats of the lambs all across the land of Israel. 
The faithful disciples in the upper room were keeping the Feast of Pentecost when the day was fully come. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. The Feast of Tabernacles took place on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, which is October, and lasted seven days. I personally believe that the man-child company, the sons of God, will be born literally and dramatically birthed upon the stage of this world in a blaze of earth-shaking supernatural power and glory during the Feast of Tabernacles time. They will be the first fruits that will enter into His fullness, the total incarnation of God upon the earth. When the Lord comes in a mighty way once more at the Feast of Tabernacles, all flesh shall see the salvation and glory of the Lord. Whatever the year may be, the manifestation of the sons of God will take place when the Feast of Tabernacles is fully come. The coming of Christ 2,000 years ago is just a miniature version of what we're about to see. Christ is coming again just as Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would account you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. This facet of the Lord's coming is called his revelation. It says, when he shall be revealed from heaven. When he comes in the Feast of Tabernacles, his coming will be greater than the singular man Jesus appearing in the sky. When he comes, he will exhibit majesty, glory, power, and such splendor as is now unknown and inconceivable. He will be, as the scripture says, revealed from heaven. That is, he will descend out of the glory of the Father in heaven and will come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. The ground of the admiration which he will receive will be what will be seen, not in the sky, not in Jerusalem, nor yet in the singular body which Thomas thrust out hand and touched and felt, but in his saints. That is, their graces, their love, their nature, their glory, their wisdom, their perfections and powers will be the occasion of producing admiration of him, for he will be seen as the source and reality of it all. One translator has rendered it, and to be made marvelous in all them that believe. I'm not so concerned about the manifestation of the sons of God. I'll look rather for the manifestation of God in his sons. His main honor when he comes in the Feast of Tabernacles will not be the outward splendors which Christendom is ever expecting, nor the angels which will accompany him, nor the display of his power over the elements and all laws of nature, but the saints who have been made one in him, and through whom he will be revealed. He will then be admired and glorified in his true body to a total and ultimate degree. This appropriate honor of Christ in the church, which is his body, has never yet been fully seen. His people on earth have in general most imperfectly reflected his image. They have been comparatively few in number and scattered upon the earth. They have been poor and despised. They have been persecuted and regarded as the filth of the world and the off-scourging of all things. The honors of this world have been withheld from them. The great have regarded it as no honor to be identified with the elect of God in any generation. And the proud have been ashamed to be enrolled among the number of those who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. At the Feast of Tabernacles all this will be changed. And those in Christ will show to admiring worlds what are the exceeding riches and power of his grace. As Ephesians 1.23 proclaims, There is a church which is his body, which is the fullness of him that filleth all things. The church is the fullness of Christ. At this time all he is comes out through his body. Christ is the fullness of God and the church is the fullness of Christ. 
nothing can be clearer than the fact that the body of Christ, notwithstanding that it has manifested much carnality, weakness, blundering, and failure through this age, will come out in the end as the magnificent exhibition of all the beauty of God's Christ. The saints shall be the expression and display of the full glory of the incomparable Son of God, for they are His fullness. Isaiah 12.2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in John 7.38, Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There is a thirst in the heart of every man for the fountain of living water. The vast majority of mankind has mistaken the thirst they have for living water to be a thirst for some temporal thing. Vainly they imagine that their thirst can be quenched by partaking of the stagnant waters of earth's cisterns. Like lost sheep, they wander through the wilderness of life, seeking satisfaction and finding none. Place after place, they roam in their pitiful search for the fountain that satisfies, but find it they never can until at last they come to Christ. Just as Christ said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He becomes all in all to every searching heart. When Jesus comes, the thirsty soul finds the fountain of living waters. Thereafter the river is in him, a literal Niagara of living water springing up into eternal life. Now let me direct your attention to the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. There was a ceremony known as the pouring out of the water. And in John 7:38, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John 7.39 said that this he spake of the Spirit which they should receive. Jesus was saying that the time would come when men would no longer draw their experiences from wells of divine provision, but an artesian fountain of living water would rise up in the soul and flow forth into humanity in mighty rivers of blessing and life. The Jewish people have always believed that their Messiah would appear on this last great day of the feast. In fact, they still believe it. This is why Jesus had to be there on that day 2,000 years ago. He had an appointment to reveal himself to Israel on that literal, typical day, and he did. On that day, as the water was poured out on the altar, it was customary for the priest to quote from Isaiah 12. And he would have concluded with the words of Isaiah 12:6, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. The priest knew nothing of the true Messiah who stood right before him. Nevertheless, there Jesus stood, the Holy One of Israel, the very fountain of life, and the substance of all their ceremonies and festivities. He does the same today. He stands in secret in our very midst, waiting for admittance. As Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. We must keep in mind that when Jesus appeared in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles 2,000 years ago, he appeared as a physical man at a symbolic ceremony and that ceremony was not the Feast of Pentecost, but the Feast of Tabernacles. It was at the Feast of Tabernacles that Jesus presented himself as the giver, by the will of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, as rivers of living water. We have erroneously associated the rivers of living water with the gift of the Holy Spirit received at the Feast of Pentecost. We have looked to Pentecost as the source of the rivers of living water, and in so doing have misappropriated the symbol entirely, and missed the larger fulfillment of the type. It cannot be denied that Jesus spoke of the outpouring of the Spirit that would follow the glorification of the head, 
But there was also a deeper teaching in his loud utterance, where after all, Pentecost is just a stepping stone to tabernacles. The blessing of tabernacles proclaims the inward revealing of the life of Jesus Christ in a fuller and mightier way than ever before experienced, that whereas Pentecost is a first fruit or earnest of the Spirit, tabernacles is a harvest or greater manifestation, a flowing of the living waters in such power that even the mortal and corruptible workings in our flesh and blood shall be swallowed up in his life and shall overflow to a fainting and thirsting world in such glory and power that it shall change and transform all things. It is the healing, life-giving stream that we read about in Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 8 through 9. These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. In Matthew 4.19, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. The manifestation of the sons of God will eclipse anything we have ever read about in the Bible or church history. This water has been flowing ever since Pentecost, but soon it shall gush forth from his harvest company who have drunk deeply at the blessed fountainhead of life and shall empty into the mighty oceans of humanity, bringing life and blessing and salvation to a dry and parched wilderness where no life is. A great outpouring from beneath the very throne of God, the dominion of God personalized in his obedient elect, will send streams of salvation into all the world. In a way never imagined by sinner or saint, the burning words of the prophet will be fulfilled as spoken in Isaiah 45, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isaiah again enlarges on this prophecy in Isaiah 52.10. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. It's true that this has happened in a measure throughout this gospel age, but it has never happened on the scale where all things are transformed under the lordship of God's Christ. We have been made eyewitnesses of the first fruits, now we await the harvest. We have been made partakers of Pentecost, and now our souls pant for the gushers of tabernacles. Jesus is coming again. He will never come again into the body of his, his humiliation, never again walk to rest upon the well or sleep in the storm-tossed boat, never to again be smitten in the face and spit upon and crucified. That part of it is finished. As Acts 1.11 says, In like manner as you have seen him go away, so will be the manner of his coming. His return on the day of Pentecost was in a mighty rushing sound, in tongues of flame, in gifts and miracles. He came to fill his body, the church, with this power. In tabernacles, all this will be reproduced on a much, much, much larger scale. It will be the full harvest of his life. He will come with the keys of death and the grave in his hands for his elect sons. He will come in power as the judge of the living and the dead. He will come as king of kings and lord of lords in sovereign grace to carry out the great work of reconciling and restoring all things. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was never intended to accomplish so great a purpose. God's purpose in this age has been not to deliver the whole creation, but to take out a people for his name, in order that by his goodness to us in Christ Jesus, he might display in the ages to come the transcendent riches of his grace, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. Having accomplished his purpose for this age, the Lord shall then use the finished product from this age, a company of sons in his own image, to be the deliverers of creation. Romans chapter 8 verses 19 through 23 says, 
For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The anointing of the sons of God shall be an anointing without measure. And the message of these sons shall be a message stripped of all the ineffectual absurdities that have been preached throughout the years. The sun is sinking in the western sky of this age of the end part realm. A new day is dawning for those who have been quickened from above. A new army is being prepared for this new day. An army of the sons of God perfected in his image, filled with the precious mind that was in Christ Jesus, radiating the glory, demonstrating the omnipotence of his power. Now the day is dawning, which Revelation 15:4 says, All nations shall come and worship before thee. Set forth in Zechariah 14:16, And all the nations shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It cannot be denied by any that throughout this age all the nations that have come to worship the Lord have worshipped Him in the Feast of Passover and Pentecost. But there is a day when all the nations shall know the Lord and feast with Him in the blessing and glory of tabernacles. We must follow on to know the Lord in His fullness. It is vain to come out unless we are committed to enter in. We are committed to a course which cannot be altered, for it is fixed in its destination, which is His throne. As Revelation 3.21 says, To him that overcometh, while I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. We don't desire the throne for what we can get out of it, for our own fame and fortune, but for the infinite potential it holds for blessing and restoring the creation. Just as Romans chapter 8 verse 20 through 22 says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. There is an elect people who are being made participators in this grandest of all dramas of history. Their prayer is soon to be answered. The long-awaited revelation is at hand. The glorious Lord is soon to be revealed from heaven in flaming fire to be exhibited in great glory and power and admired in His saints. Don't settle for less than God's best. You have kept the Feast of Passover, and I trust that you have also kept the Feast of Pentecost. But we will now move on from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion, where we may keep the next feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. The power of His presence will be manifested in a way never seen before. Let us go up to the feast. Jesus will meet us there.